Good evening, good evening, everyone. And thank you for joining us this evening for our part three. And let me get this uh, squared away. Hopefully you can see my screen. Okay. Now I am your trainer this evening. My name is David, the financial ambassador Leach. I'm also a Grant Cardone licensee and sales coach and I'm 10X marketing certified, certified credit consultant, and I'm also an army vet. And I'll actually be going to 10X headquarters next week for my level five training to get certified as a speaker, a coach, and a mentor. Now, my mentor is Grant Cardone, internationally renowned business and sales expert, author of eight sales and business books, and he's a real estate investor and philanthropist. Now, as I stated, we're going to be covering the closing and negotiating masterclass, how to get your customers to say yes to you, part one, but we're actually going to jump ahead and jump to part three. If you haven't seen part one, part one, I believe is in the registration link. If you registered, you had access to that. And part two is actually on the YouTube channel, if you missed that, but we're going to get started with part Three, give me one sec, here we go. And let me make sure we got this straight. All right, so part three is our introduction. Uh, let's move into the rules of closing. The close has rules and the rules, like in any game, must be applied or you're not gonna get the job done. This is particularly true when closing the deal. If you don't abide by these rules, you won't be able to ensure your success. There are 20 major rules, and we're going to go over each one of them in the next two sections of this training. In addition to writing them down as I go through them, I also recommend that you put them in a place where you are triggered to review them periodically. At Cardone Enterprises, we treat them as a firm policy and we do not violate them under any condition. So, first, always be seated when negotiating a close. This is a policy that is often violated and frequently missed even by the most seasoned professionals. It's harder to close someone if you're standing up. And it's even harder if they're standing up too. You have to get people seated. The saying goes, present the product, the service, your proposal, and your idea on your feet. Always nego negotiate the terms from your seat. In addition to making sure you are seated when attempting an agreement for closure, be sure that the prospect is seated. If you're working with multiple parties to close the deal, such as a board, make sure everyone is seated. That means you have to learn how to control people. Control in a good way, not control in a bad way. No control is bad control. Control in the sense of, hey, sit down, let's get this done. It's good control, all right? Even if your prospect stands up, you should remain seated, which suggests that you're not done. You're not reacting and that you're confident of an agreement. Getting up all of a sudden when they do is just a reaction. When you go from seated position to a standing position, it suggests that something's changed, possibly even ended. It gives your customer or your prospect the right to exit and end negotiations. You've got to make people comfortable. You've got to get them in the chair. Ask yourself, what can I do to make them comfortable? Get them a Coke, a cup of coffee, something to drink, something to eat, anything to keep them in that chair. Your job is not just to present numbers to people, but make a proposal or even close the deal. Get them in the chair and get them comfortable sitting there. All right. Now we go to number two. Always present your proposal in writing. People believe what they see, not what they hear. People do not believe just the words that are spoken. They believe what they can actually see. It gets validated. 
that which is written is more credible and more valued than that which is simply just talk or spoken. Remember the old saying, talk is cheap. It, pay, it plays out big here in the close. Always have a contract, a pen, and a legal pad next to you on which you can make your points. The legal pad makes your points. It supports anything you're saying, anything offered, any points of value that are included or might be expected should be written down for everyone to see. I'll give you, excuse me, I'll give you an example. If your product or service has a warranty that is standard in your offering, still write it down. By the way, it has a warranty for five years. Whatever the deal is, you want to write it down. Validate and verify in writing what people are getting because it becomes more real to them and they value it more. Does that make sense? This is overlooked. In fact, 99% of all negotiators in all transactions missed this one simple point. All too often, the closer assumes, oh, since it's, it's included and everybody includes it, it, should, it shouldn't be disclosed. There are two issues here. Number one, you didn't disclose it. Number two, you didn't write it down. It doesn't matter if you're selling a product and everybody offers the same thing on that product. You should still write it down because the other 99 people that they shop won't. Too many salespeople assume the customer knows when the customer doesn't. Anything of value should be accentuated, written down, and brought to attention. You want to shine the light on the positive. It should be used to build your case of logic. And you can only get logical with, with people if they see it in writing. Otherwise, they're not going to trust it. You're giving people reasons to want to do business with you. The more reasons you can give them, the easier they're going to be able to make sense of saying, let's do this. Any offers, write them down. Anything included, write it down. Things that you think are common to your proposal, write it down. How they're going to uh, title the vehicle, write it down. How they're going to title the product, write it down. Down. whose name it might be in or any other names write it down anything you use to substantiate your offer write it down any comparisons you might make write it down lastly while you're writing you might want to consider sitting next to your buyer rather than across from your buyer but we'll talk about that in a later segment remember people believe what they see not what they hear if you say it, write it. Oops. Got yes, somebody come in. All right. Number three is always clearly communicate your proposal. It's extremely important that you rehearse because when you rehearse, you know your pre presentation. You want to clearly communicate what your offer is. You don't want to mumble. You don't want to cover your mouth or quietly say, I think we can do this for you. You want to speak it out there loud and clear. You want to speak clearly and confidently so that your offer is communicated in a manner that suggests optimism, pride, credibility. For instance, if a theater was burning down, you'll say, hey, come on, let's go. Somebody's going to lead the group inside the theater because the place is burning down. You really have to put your voice out there. You can't mumble and you can't whisper. When Grant speaks to an audience of a thousand people, he's not speaking to just the first row. He's speaking to the back row. He wants everybody to get the same communication. Look, nobody's going to trust you if you don't communicate clearly, confidently, and project your voice. Have you ever known somebody that whispers and always speaks in a really low tone and you're always having to say, what do you say? What do you say? <laughs> I, I, I hate that. Do you trust that communication? Probably not. Do you value it? Would you give it credibility? Probably not. Look, you need to practice this delivery. Do not just assume because you know how to speak that you're communicating clearly. You're completely different 
things. They're completely different things. Now, what Grant did uh, did to master this skill is practice. He practiced with recorders and video for literally years. He would then play those recordings back to ensure that his communication was actually penetrating and making a difference and not just hitting them and then bouncing off. You want your communication to penetrate and you want to use a good, clear voice. I think I'm doing a good job. Give me a shout out in, in the chat with a five or something. <laughs> You've got to say, I know we can do this. Not, I think we can do this. Say, I know we can do this. Here's your proposal all worked out for you. I need your initials here, here, and here. This is communicating clearly, penetrating communication, where you're actually pushing through. It is, an, it is as important as the actual words you say. Know what you're going to say and say it with confidence. Think like you're going to talk in all capital letters. If you get a text from somebody in all caps, you're usually like, are you screaming at me? We don't want to scream at people, but we do want to communicate clearly. This is going to take you practicing and rehearsing and not just testing. So to review, you communicate how? Clearly. Now we're going to jump to number four. Always make eye contact. You want to make eye contact and maintain eye contact with the persons you're in front of. If there's multiple people there, you want eye contact with all of them, particularly with the decision maker. You want to avoid wandering eyes at all costs and look directly into their eyes. This will keep you from being distracted by other things. You don't want to be text messaging either. How offensive is that to a customer? You don't want to be talking to customers. Hang on one second, sir. I've got an emergency from my wife. You need to have somebody else handle this emergency with your wife, your kids, the house, or whatever it may be. You're going to wreck deals if you don't have your full attention and full, and full eye contact on that person in front of you. Things like eye contact, eye contact, projecting your voice, and speaking with confidence while all these things may seem simple to you, this is a discipline. Discipline is something that's learned. It's instilled only through practice. So if you're a manager that's watching this and thinking, man, my people don't do that. They don't speak with confidence and they don't make eye contact. Well, how could they? Nobody taught them how. You didn't learn it in school. They don't teach it in grade school or even high school. They don't teach it in college. Harvard, Yale, and even MIT don't teach people how to make on eye contact and communicate clearly. This is something you need to work on. All right. That make a whole lot of sense to me. I don't know about you. In fact, the majority of people on this planet do not make eye contact. Think about when you walk down the street into a coffee shop or into your workplace and say hi to somebody. Do they make eye contact? Nope. So I challenge you, if you walk down the street and ask, some, and ask somebody for directions, do they engage or look away? Most of the time, they won't even look at you. Next time you do this, pay attention and see what happens. If you want to be believed, if you want to gain trust and credibility, if you want to close deals, it is vital that you make eye contact and not just talk. Your job is not to just talk. Your job is to make eye contact because eye contact suggests interest and confidence in yourself, your products, your services, and your proposal. Facts. Oops, let me back up. One. Now, number five is always have a pen available. Have you ever heard always be closing? It's great, except for when the closer finds him or herself without a pen to sign the contract. One time Grant was closing the deal. The guy was a little touch and go on the close. Uh, he would get hot and then he would get cold. The buyer finally said, okay, I'm in. Let's go. Let's do it. Grant reached for his pen in his pocket, but couldn't find it. It was gone. The guy looked at him and said, you know what? That's a sign. I shouldn't do this right now. Grant was devastated. Now he refuses to go anywhere without a pen to get a signature. In other words, no ink means no deal. 
It doesn't matter what you sell, how simple or complicated it may be. All agreements require signatures that, uh, all si let me back up. All agreements require signatures and that require some form of ink. You need to keep a pen available on you at all times. Oops, I backed up, went too fast, let me back up. In fact, you should always have a backup pen in case yours doesn't work. Also, you should you might want to consider keeping a nice pen that portrays you as a professional, not a fake mon blank pen, a nice pen. It's important to invest in nice things and invest in your profession. To always be closing means you always need the tools. You need what? The right attitude. You need to be need prepared closes. You need to dress professionally. You need a desk that's neat. You need contracts right there in front of you. You need an evidence manual, success stories, support materials. You need a nice pen to sign with. You can even use the pen as a giveaway. Say sign here and keep the pen. This is my good luck closing pen. It'll never fail you either. Keep it for yourself. The point of this is what? Keep a pen and have a backup. It's your sword. Put yourself in a situation to close and have some ink. Number six, always use humor to relieve pressure. Now, this is an absolute art used by the greats and a skill that has to be practiced. It's not something that can just be given to you. You have to create this yourself. To get humor into your clothes, you can use things like stories. Stories in many ways are there to relieve pressure and make the case that you're trying to make. Life many times reveals itself through stories, not just facts. Think about it. Have you ever met anyone that doesn't love a good story? If the story contains humor, it'll cause your customers to relax in the clothes. I'll give you an example. Say a buyer tells me he needs to think about it. When I respond with, oh, sir, I just realized you're sitting in the wrong chair. And he's like, what are you talking about? Sir, you're sitting in the thinker's chair. No wonder you've got to think about it. I then get up, uh, move him over to the buyer's chair, apologize to him, move him into the decision-making chair. And I then say, I apologize again for doing that to you. Now let's work this out. See, that's humor. Maybe you can use that, maybe not. Maybe it doesn't fit you. But when you're looking at closing more deals, you're looking to increase your game and do more than just what you're comfortable with. Here's another example. Let's say I'm in a closing situation and the buyer says, hey, look, the price is too high. And I say, everyone that sits in that chair says the price is too high. I've got to get rid of that chair. I'm using humor to bring some levity, some humor to soften things up. You may find these corny, but you can create your own. Bottom line, you need humor and you need it in the clothes. Now, there's a couple of things you want to be careful about. Humor can be offensive. You do not want to use any humor that could offend people. You want to stay away from anything that's off color. You want to stay away from politics. You want to stay away from religion. Anything that can offend people, leave it alone. It's not worth the risk. Also, avoid using humor that makes fun of others. You don't want to make fun of your customer. You don't want to make fun of coworkers. You don't want to make fun of your competition. You want to use the humor that causes your buyer to feel good, to feel positive, and that reminds them that life is to be enjoyed, not endured. The clothes doesn't have to be painful thing. Any humor that can make people feel good, inspired, and hopeful, hopeful is always appropriate. In fact, people are more likely to make decisions when they're less serious than when they become serious. People do not make decisions when they are very serious. They tend to think instead. When people are less serious and when things are less important, they're enjoying themselves more and they tend to make decisions and flow money more easily. People pay more for entertainment in this country than they do for education. That's a fact. 
The reason is they feel good when they're entertained. It's the same reason why stories sell. They make people feel good and people then are able to make a decision. Again, make sure your humor makes the prospect feel good. Make your clothes more about fun than a critical decision. Make it more about how they will look good, feel good, and enjoy how they're doing the right thing than about doing something serious thing. You as a closer will close more deals when you're able to get your client to lighten up, to laugh, to have fun, and to be less serious. Grant has used humor to make the edge off of situations his entire selling career. And the better he got at selling, the more humor he's able to impinge into the selling environment. Humor com combined with right techniques on how to close makes you unstoppable. Next, we have number seven, always ask one more time. This is very simple rule will be one of the most difficult rules you will ever apply. Asking one more time is what separates closers from sellers. It separates the big money players from the average producer. To continue to ask, to persist, to figure out another creative way to circle back after being told no multiple times, to reposition yourself and your negotiations and ask again is ultimately what will make you one of the greats. This requires that you have a very deep arsenal of techniques. That means you need a lot of technology, a lot of different approaches, and a complete understanding of all the closes in order for you to continue to persist. And we're going to cover a lot of uh, closes during this training. Look, the only way you can wear out through resistance is through persistence. This requires that you know hundreds of closes so that you're able to weave them together. You need to know them all, not just, I know close number one, close number 74, close number 94, close number 181. You need to know them so well that you can weave 181 with 72, with 44, and with 56. You've got to weave and tell a story until you finally get a yes. This whole topic of persistence or being unreasonable is a social issue. Since you were a child, you were probably told that persistence was a bad thing. Remember when we talked about the segment on pressure? Oh, pressure is a bad thing. Persistence is a bad thing. You're being rude. You're being obnoxious. Can't you listen? Can you hear me? Look, don't ask me again. Have you ever been told any of this stuff? I'm sure you have. Maybe you're the parent now and you tell your kids that they're stubborn, quit being stubborn, quit asking me, listen to me, right? Have you done that? I know I have. Look, these are just negative responses to persistence. As a professional, you need to figure out another way to ask. You've got to ask yourself, how do I reposition myself? If you're persistent, you can be told yes after being told no multiple times. Why? Because you persisted. It doesn't mean you didn't listen. It only means you, you're more sold on your view than on any others. Like this one right here. Vince Lombardi, one of the great, greatest football coaches of our time, said, winners never quit and quitters never win. Who wants to say yes to a quitter? Do you think your customer, your prospect, your client is going to say yes to a quitter? And how can they? Treat every opportunity to close like your life depends on it. Because it does. Practice not quitting in everything you do. Even when you work out. If you're going to do 20 reps, don't stop on 19. In fact, what you might want to do is 10% more reps or 10% more of everything that you said you would do. Now I got a little exercise for you. And being that we're in a virtual environment, uh, we're only gonna do it a different way, okay? So let's say that uh, how strong you can build this persistence muscle, like any muscle, it will get stronger if you drill it. 
drill it. Drill it until you're not being rude or ill-mannered, but you're being professional, persistent, and confident asking for the business one more time. Now, we're going to do this for three minutes. I'm only going to use one minute. And we're going to, we're going to, like I said, we're virtual, so we're not going to do that. But right now, I, what I want you to do is pull out your digital calendar. Right now, go ahead and grab your digital calendar and schedule 10 minutes a day for the next 30 days to go through this exercise and role play different scenarios, closing with someone. It can be your spouse, your child, a friend, ideally someone that you work with who is also committed to improving their closing skills. Can y'all do that? 10 minutes a day for the next 30 days. All right, number eight, always have an arsenal of closes. If you don't have an arsenal of close, closes available, you're not going to know what to say. Most people quit because they lack variations of closes say you have three four or five closes if you if they resist you three or four or five times you're done you need a large variety of closes to handle all the different customer types and all the different types of objections remember when remember when we talked about the correct estimation of effort you don't go into war with the correct estimation of manpower artillery food, supplies, etc. It is said that most prospects close after five attempts. That may or may not be true, but what is true is that the average salesperson only has four closes available. You don't want to have four or five closes. You want to have hundreds of them available, just in case. You don't just, uh, you want just enough food to eat this winter, or you don't want just enough food to eat this winter, you want extra just in case, right? You don't prepare for a hurricane at a minimal level. You want to prepare for the hurricane at a maximum level. You want to become a master at the close through repetition. Know the closes like you know your name. Know them so well that you can use them in any order and with any complete confidence. Most salespeople are using this one on a daily basis. What do I have to do? What would it take? I want to earn your business, but that's not even close. How much time do you need to think about? Why do you need to think about it? Make me an offer. If I could get that done, would you do it? It doesn't matter if you're selling real estate, appliances, mortgages, automobiles, or you're raising money for fundraisers. Those closes have been used for so long that they're not even effective anymore. Most salespeople are not aware of all the possibilities that they will need to close over. The first thing you've got to know is what the possibilities are so you can provide or create the solutions. If you don't know the possibilities, you'll never come up with enough closes. If you don't know how bad the hurricane can be, how can you prepare for it? Know the possibilities because the truth is it doesn't go on and on. It's a finite number of situations, but you need to know every one of them and you need to have a close that will handle each one of them. Let's review. First, know the possibilities, then learn all the closes on how, on how to handle them. Number nine, always stay with the buyer. You want to reduce or ideally eliminate the number of times you leave your buyer alone or leave to go check with somebody else. It's extremely important that you continue to create and leverage credibility with your customer. The reality is there are entire industries that believe in trust and relationships, but are built around leaving a customer and going to check with someone else. Each time you leave a customer to check on some other item or something else, you're leaving him or her with someone else, themselves, right? You're not there to control the situation, the thought process, or what's going on. This creates doubt and uncertainty in the mind of the buyer and also stops any chance of selling anything. For instance, 
The automobile industry has been notorious for leaving their customers over years. Hey, I've got to go check with the manager. I've got to check to see if I can get that approved. The reality of the situation is that you lost credibility with your customer because they realize, hey, I'm not talking to the decision maker. He can't make a decision. He's got to go talk to his manager. If I leave the customer, they leave me. If you do this five or six times, it takes six hours to do the transaction. This is the single greatest pet peeve of car buyers. It's not how much they pay. It's not that they wanted a black car and got a red one. That's not it. It's the it's that the black the back and forth creates undue antagonism and it will do the same thing in your negotiations. It lowers perceived value. It reduces customer experience and extends the amount of time necessary to close the deal. If you feel like you need to leave your prospect to check with somebody else, instead, why don't you stay with them and make a phone call? Hey, give me one second. I'll text this over and see if I can get it approved. That's better than leaving them. Or why don't you just Skype your manager if you actually need to talk to a third party? These are just a couple of things that you could do to keep you in front of the money, the buyer, and still get the information you need if there's a third party involved. One time, Grant had a customer that he was with for a long time. Grant was operating as though he was the decision maker, even though he actually wasn't. The customer actually asked him, hey, why don't you check with one of your supervisors? superiors and see if they can do anything else grant said sure i'll do that first rule of selling is to agree grant then said how long would you like me to be gone the guy said what does it matter grant says you want me to be gone for five minutes 15 minutes 50 minutes how long he's like well what does it matter grant said it doesn't it doesn't matter i'm coming back with the same thing anyway this is going to be the proposal they approve. This is a great deal. Let's do it. And the guy closed. The buyer was using the, superior, using the superior or manager to get Grant out of his space. He wanted to say yes to him. And he, and he also wanted to say no to him. And he knew that if Grant stayed there, he'd say yes. He was trying to get Grant out of the clothes. Staying in the clothes with the money gives you maximum credibility. Remember, the customer has the money. When you leave the customer, you're leaving the money. And that's when you lose credibility. Learn how to stay with your customer. And we got the last one, which is number 10. Let me back up. I know I won't, I'm going to be moving too fast sometimes. Always treat your prospect like a buyer. I know I've always heard Grant say, treat people like millionaires and they'll act like millionaires one of the biggest errors made in negotiations particularly by experienced salespeople, is the mistaken ability to determine who is a buyer and who is not i'm sure every single one of you listening right now can think of multiple times when you made this error and it cost you the business regardless of the circumstances no money no budget taxes, not the decision maker, can't make a decision, regardless of what you hear, always treat the prospect like he or she is a buyer, whether they have $10 or 100 million, treat them like they will buy from you, no matter how difficult, how tough, how resistant, how hard to close they are, treat them like a solid gold, like they're a VIP, like they're royalty. And no matter how financially screwed up they are, treat them like they can play and never speak negatively about them to other coworkers. Grant has a little trick he uses when he uh, has a tough customer in a close and he's st uh, starting to believe that they won't buy. What he does is he surveys the prospect for all the signs that would demonstrate that they have bought in the past. He notices their watch, their shirt, their suit, their necklace, the car they drove up in, the fact that they have a credit card. Maybe he knows them 
and remembers being at their house or that they spent that money on a party. He collects evidence that suggests there's a history of buying. So regardless of what this person's telling him, he always tells himself, Grant, every buyer is a buyer. It's his mantra. To review, knock off the negative talk, knock off the blame, and treat everybody like their buyers. If you truly believe they will buy today, tomorrow, or one day in the future, it will change everything you do with your customer. Every human being on this planet is a buyer. And one day, someday, somehow, some way, they're going to buy. All right? So I hope you got some value from tonight. I know it was short this today. We just talked about the rules of closing for part three. But next week, we'll be talking about part four, which is the advanced rules of closing. So make sure, set your clock 725 to make sure you're here next Thursday. Like I said, I will be leaving for Miami on Monday. I should be back by Thursday. Uh, if I'm not, I will uh, email you, but I'm pretty sure I'll be home in time to start with part four of advanced rules of the closing. Now, I also want to share with you because I'm recently starting to do some group coaching uh, for people at an affordable rate. You know, if you went to Grant, there's $100,000 for him to coach you, but I'm nowhere near that and everything. And I'm actually having an introductory rate. And you also have access to Cardone University, the number one sales and business platform, online platform in the world. And a lot of Fortune 500 companies, your uh, users are Grant Cardone University. Now, we call that do-it-yourself. And as a licensee, I can offer that for $9.97 for the year. Uh, if you were to go to contact 10X headquarters, you're going to pay uh, 1500 okay now my car my coaching is only 197 dollars a month it's weekly coaching we'll be going through things you'll have access to this coaching program that i'm showing on the screen we'll be covering things like attitude and mindset because you need to get that right talk about goals and targets mastering objections prospecting greeting fact finding selection and demo negotiation and closing, uh, objection handling, follow-up, inbound phone calls, outbound phone calls, uh, internet leads, personal dy dynamics assessment, sales meetings as well. Uh, I do do this uh, group coaching is done by three months, six months, or 12 months. And if you want to learn more information about that, you can text me coach, coaching or coach at 302-709-1290. I hope you got some value from this information this evening. I want to thank everybody for tuning in. And as tonight was short, I want to say 10X, everybody. Have a great evening. And thanks again for tuning in. Good night.